Uh, why don't we just go ahead and get started? I'll say a prayer and then we'll get to it. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Is it loud enough? Okay. I can't tell up here if I'm loud enough or not. If I don't, if I'm not loud enough, please tell me I can turn it up just a little bit. So if you can't hear me. Let's just have a word of prayer and we will get started. I have a mint in my mouth before I pray. I get so dry, I'm going to try that tonight. I'm afraid I'll spit the mats while I don't use them. I don't usually do that, but I get so dry, so I'm going to try it this time. Okay, let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for today. Thank you, Lord, for who you are to us. And uh, we just praise your holy name for, because you're worthy to be praised. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for our leaders of our country that they might listen to your word in your leading. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for all the freedoms we have in this country. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you will just put a hedge around those freedoms and protect them from the people that are trying to take them away from us. Lord, we ask you to come tonight and be with us as we walk through these pages of your word and to enlighten us and to uh, help us understand what you want us to know in these scriptures. I ask a special blessing on everyone that's here, and I ask a special blessing on this lesson. And we'll just lift these things up to you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Last week, we walked through the seven churches that John was told to address in chapters two and three. We learned they're actual, they were actually churches in, in uh, John's day, but they also, some people believe, they represent different ages of Christianity from Pentecost all the way to the rapture of the church. Now, I realize that the rapture of the church is very controversial. There's really about four different views of the rapture. I put this up on the wall so you can see it. Um, one view is that there is no such thing as a rapture. That's just escapism. Okay. The other uh, view, the, the next view, number two, is pre-tribulation. That means that uh, that the people that are pre-trib believe that there will be a rapture sometime before the seven year of tribulation starts. Then we have mid-tribulation. That's people that believe that in the middle, after three and a half years, the rapture of the church occurs. And then you have the post-trib. Post-trib is if you believe that when the, the end of the tribulation comes, Christ comes and raptures the church, and the, church, the rapture of the church and the second coming are all one event. So that's the four main things. I'm sure there are different views of, of other people, but that's the four main ones that, that uh, we have today. So I encourage you to study this stuff. Don't take anybody's word for anything. Study your scriptures and let God lead you into your beliefs if you don't have one already. Uh, Controversy can actually be very productive if we let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us through the scripture. There's no reason why all of us cannot agree to disagree because we're Christians. And so we don't want to get hung up on an argument because the main rib belief that we need to have is that Jesus Christ came, died for us, and redeemed us from sin. That's our that's our main goal in here, to know that, and that he resurrected, and that someday he'll come to get us again. Y'all know the Holy Spirit is not the author of chaos and confusion. So if we'll let him be our guide, and always keep that in the back of your mind, that he is going to guide us when we study his word. And he will enlighten us. He will not confuse. And he will not cause chaos. 
Before we get into the reading of chapter 4, tonight we'll cover 4 and 5, I want to tell you a couple of things about the old traditions of Israel and the Feast of Israel. The first is the old ancient wedding of a Jewish person. The first thing that happens is a, is the father of a family, when he decides his son is ready to be married, he goes out and starts looking for a suitable girl for his son to marry. Now, when he finds someone that he considers to be appropriate for his son, he will go to that family and negotiate with them for a bride price or a dowry. You might know what a dowry is, but that that was very well known in ancient times for the girl to have a dowry. When both families came to an agreement, they would sign a contract that showed both families would sign this to show both families understood what this was. At this point, the bride and, and the groom would be taken separately out to a pool to be em completely immersed in water to symbolize their spiritual cleansing. Now, after that, they would come back and they would come under a canopy that was made just for this occasion. They usually did it outside. They took four poles and set them up and they stretched sheets or netting or maybe even uh, flowers and different things. Some were very elaborate and some were very simply done depending on the family. And these two would come under the canopy and they would take betrothal vows under the canopy. Now, these vows were very binding. And in order for either of the groom or the bride to get out of that, they had to have a legal divorce. They couldn't just say, okay, I've changed my mind, I'm not going to do that. No, this was more like an American wedding, that it was called a betrothal. And they would commit themselves and their lives to each other under that canopy. Now, there will be a wedding ceremony later. But this was a binding contract between families. It wasn't uh, American weddings are more like the bride and groom are committed. This is like both families are committed to this marriage, okay? Now, at this point, the son is going to go back with the father to the father's house and he will build his bride a room onto the father's house for he and his bride. Before he leaves, he goes to his, his new bride and he says this to her. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you will be also. Then he would give her a gift. And this gift was to remind her and guarantee to her that he would come back and get her. And it would also remind her that he would be thinking of her the whole time that he was away from her. Now, he couldn't give her a date as to when he was going to come back. He couldn't give her a day that he was going to come back because the father is the one that would tell him when he thought the room was suitable for he, his, he, the groom and his bride, then he would tell the groom he could go and give his bride. So this usually lasted anywhere from one to two years. So that's kind of a long time. We don't think of of uh, engagements being, and they were probably didn't see each other again until he came to get her. Now, when the father did give the permission and he said that the room was ready and the son could go, he would gather up his friends 
and they would travel in kind of a processional travel, and they're laughing, they're celebrating, and they're going to get this friend's bride, and they're all happy. Now, someone in the party would sneak out right before they got to the bride's house and tell her the groom was on his way. And she would gather all of the things that she'd been preparing for this year or two years, and she would have them ready to go. And she would gather her friends and her family so they would all be ready when the groom arrived. Then they would all travel back to the groom's home, and they would celebrate all the way. Now, when they came to the father's house, they would gather again under a canopy, and they would finalize their wedding vows to each other. After that, the groom would take his bride into the room he had prepared for them, and they would stay seven days. When they came out, they would have the marriage supper with family and friends. Now, that's an old, ancient way of Jewish people getting married. They did that way back. I'm not sure they do that anymore. They may do some of that. I don't know if they do all of that. But that's an old, ancient wedding. Now, God chose all of us as a bride for his son. John, would you read Ephesians 1, 3, and 4? It's on the extras. In the extras? Yeah, there's, there's the scripture and then the extras. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in okay. love. And then read John six forty four. It's on the same page. <laughs> okay. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So God chose all of us to be his son's bride. Right? Now the bride price was paid by God the Father, and that was the shedding of the blood of his son. Jesus had his spiritual cleansing at his baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. Now the bride gets her spiritual cleansing at her baptize, at her baptism when she's saved. Christ goes back to the Father's house to prepare a place for his bride. John read John 14 2. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus gives his bride a gift before he goes to the Father's house to prepare a place for her so that he can use that as a guarantee that he will be back to get her someday. He doesn't know when. He doesn't know the day because only his Father knows the time. What do you think he left the, the bride as a gift? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, that's right. John, would you read 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22? Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a plague. So when Jesus comes to claim his bride, he will take his bride to his father's house and they will spend seven days and then have the marriage supper of the Lamb. All right, now that's not scriptural. It's just a it's just a wedding. But do you see how it correlates? It just is to me. It's like a picture of what Christ did for us. It's not scripture. It's just a tradition that they did way back then. 
Now, the next thing I want to go over is the seven major feasts. Now, these are in the scriptures. They're in Leviticus 23. If you ever want to go back and read all of those about the, uh, the seven major feasts, you're welcome to do that. We're not going to read them tonight because it will take too long. All right. God calls these major feasts a holy convocation. Holy means we are set apart or something is set apart for God's use. <laughs> Convocations is an English word trans translated from the Hebrew word micra. And micra means rehearsal. The act of practicing something now in preparation for an event that will take place in the future. The Jewish calendar now is different than ours. It is dependent on the circle of the cycle of the moon. Ours is dependent on the cycle of the sun. Y'all know that. They have 360 days in their year. We have 365. And therefore, when we look at our calendar, their feast will fall on different days in our calendar. But of course, they fall on the same days of their calendar. Now, this first feast is in the first month of the Jewish month, which is Nisan. On the 14th day of the month, they were to celebrate Passover. Passover happened in 2023 this year on April the 5th at sundown. All of their days start at sundown. Okay? Our start in the morning, their start at sundown. All right, we're familiar with this feast because it was to comm commemorate the last plague, plague in uh, Egypt when the death angel came and passed over the houses that had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Y'all are familiar with that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It is believed that Jesus fulfilled this feast when he was on the cross. At the exact time that they nailed him to the cross, they were sacrificing the lamb at the temple. In his death, Jesus was given the fire of God's judgment and the wrath for you and I. Now, the second feast took place the day after the Passover feast, and it was called Unleavened Bread. Does anybody know what unleavened stands for in the scripture? No yeast. No yeast, which stands for sin. No sin. So it's used symbolically all through the Testaments about unleavened, meaning no sin. Jesus was laid in the tomb on the day of unleavened bread. Now, the third feast is called First Fruits. Now, this, this feast always takes place on the first Sunday after the Passover, regardless of of what day of the week that the Passover falls on, the first fruits always hits the Sunday after Passover. This is when Jesus was raised from the dead. And the first fruits, he was the very first fruit of many that will come from death to life and never die again. This day is the day that Christians call Easter. All right, the fourth feast is called Pentecost, and it took place 50 days after first fruits. This is a picture of the filling of the Holy Spirit. John read Acts 1, 4, and 5. Gathering together, he commanded them to not leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
Okay, so that is Pentecost. Now, the first four feasts that we just went over, they take place in spring and early summer. The last three feasts take place in the fall. You will notice between the last the the last one of the spring, which is number four, and number five, there is a gap between those. Now, the fifth feast ha has not been fulfilled yet. It is called the Feast of Trumpets. This one is a little bit mysterious in Scripture because it really doesn't tell a whole lot about this feast in Leviticus. It's believed to be a picture of the rapture of the church. It starts on <coughs> this year at sundown, September the 15th. You all know that's Friday mm -hmm. this week. <laughs> okay. Great. I thought that was kind of, yeah, I'm ready, aren't you? <laughs> is it always September 15th or is it? No, it, it's not always. Each each one of these are, I'm giving you our dates, right. and it's their dates, so it always is different. Okay. Sandra, do you have any time on that? I have golf in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't start till sundown. You're, you're good till sundown. Good till sundown. Good. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> All right. The sixth piece now is the Day of Atonement. This is not a happy feast. This is a, a feast of reflecting your sin and getting yourself ready for uh, repentance. This is believed to be the seven-year tribulation. It's the Day of Atonement. And the last feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, or Booths. This one is a great celebration where uh, this one will take place in the millennial. Yes. Christ has the millennial booths. Tabernacle or booths, B O O T H S. This one celebrated the fact that God would dwell with his people. And that'll happen in the future, in the millennium. All right. Now, let's talk about the rapture of the church. I'll give you the scriptures of what I believe is calling the rapture of the church. And John's going to read them out for us. The first one is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. It's on the other uh. It's on the, it's not with the revelation. It's on the, it's on the extra sheet. Extra? Extra. I've got 1 Corinthians 5, 10. I'll read it. Yeah. I may have messed yours up. I don't know. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. All right. And the second one is second is first Corinthians. Do you have that one? Five uh, ten. No, first Corinthians fifteen, fifty one, and fifty two. Mm -hmm. I just really messed that up, didn't I? <laughs> I'll read that one too. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, or the trumpet will sound. And the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. 
All right, both of these are written by Paul, and he is explaining the first one in Thessalonians. People were worrying because their people were dying, and they thought Jesus was going to go back and, and fix that uh, dwelling place for us in just a few days and be back and get down and go back, and that wasn't happening. There was people dying. Some of the disciples were dying, and they were getting a little bit worried about that. What happened to these people that were Christians and died? And so he told them not to worry about it because when Christ came, those that were dead in Christ would rise first and then the rest that were alive would follow up with them and meet Christ in the air. I think that's important that we remember that. Plus, it's important that we remember that he said to comfort each other with these words. And then the second one is he's telling us What's going to happen to our mortal bodies when that happens? They're going to be, it's going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. So I know that some people call this rapture escapism. That people that believe in the rapture are just trying to figure out a way to escape tribulation because we go through tribulation on earth. That's true. We know that we have to go through some tribulation. Uh, Jesus even told us in John 16, 33, that the world, we would have tribulation in the world, but to be of good cheer because he had overcome the world. But the seven-year tribulation is all about the wrath of God. Now, let me read you some of these scriptures that talk about the wrath of God. And y'all listen real carefully. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. That's First Thessalonians 1 10. One ten. Much more, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Romans 5, 9. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1, 18. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Revelation 3, 10. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Revelations 19, 15. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 5, 6. How, this one's really good. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was at the first spoken through the Lord. It was confirmed to us by those who heard. Hebrews 2, 3. So that's that escapism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, one more. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9. Uh-huh. Now it's your turn to read, John. I'm sorry? It's your turn. 
Revelations 4, 1. Over here. Yeah. <laughs> I thought if I separated them, it would be easier for you. <laughs> After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after these things. All right, many commentators believe this verse is another picture of the rapture because we will not hear the church mentioned anymore until we get to chapter 19 when it starts talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, if this one verse in Revelation was the only evidence of a rapture, I'd say that'd be pretty weak. But if you take that one verse and combine it with the other verses that I've uh, read to you, it, it, it all makes good sense then for the, the rapture. Uh, there are people that do have uh, scriptures that do not believe there is a rapture of the church. I just believe there is so much evidence showing us that we will not face the wrath of God, and that's why he will take us out. All right. One other objection people have to the rapture, and I know you've heard this, that they say it is a very late uh, teaching, that it didn't come around until the 1900s. And that just isn't true. We have some... Uh, earlier scholars in the first and second century that wrote about the rapture. I'm going to give you three of them. Irenaeus, he was a disciple of Polycarp, and he lived from 130 A.D. to 202 A.D., and he wrote, he wrote being caught up to heaven before the tribulation. Cipri Cyprian lived 200 A.D. to 258 A.D. and wrote about believers taken away before the seven-year tribulation. And the last one, Ephraim, lived at 300, from 306 to 376 A.D., taught of a gathering of the saints before the tribulation. So that's three. There's more than that, but that's three main ones that I know of. Okay. John, would you read Revelation 4, 2? <clears throat> Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. All right. Immediately John is in the Spirit, and he sees someone in heaven sitting on the throne. We can't be sure exactly what it's meant by John is in the spirit, but we do know that Paul had a similar uh, experience back in uh, 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, where he was translated into the third heaven. Do you all understand the three levels of heaven? Our atmosphere is heaven one around the earth with the gravity. The stars and the moons and the planets is level two of heaven. And then where God lives is heaven three. So y'all remember that. Because that's scriptural. I'm not just giving y'all something. So okay. that's in the scripture? That is in the scripture. Yes. Okay. And you can find it if you'll search for it. I promise. <laughs> All right. John may have been translated up into heaven and was seeing all this, or he may be seeing a vision of being translated up into heaven. We don't know for sure, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is what he sees when he gets there. There is a throne, and there is someone sitting on this throne. John read verses 3 and 4. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne and an emerald in appearance. 
around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. All right. There's no human words to describe this one sitting on the throne. So what John tries to do is give us some images so we can picture it in our mind what this being looks like. Now he had two stones. Uh, he it, the two stones that John describes in here. If you if you read about the priestly garments, this is the first stone and the last stone in the the high priest plate that they put on their chest. Do y'all re y'all remember that plate of the high priest? So some think that that this is trying to remind us that Jesus is our high priest. But some believe this jasper, which is clear like a diamond, represents the purity of Christ, and the sardius is red, and so it represents the blood shed by Christ. Personally, I think it could be both, because mm -hmm. they both sound reasonable. Now, the rainbow around the throne represents the promise God gave creation after the flood. It reminds us of how faithful our God is and that he never fails to bring forth his promises. The rainbow of the emerald green represents eternal life. Now the 24 elders, I, they are believers. I, you know, I don't know if you'd say they represented the whole church or not, but they are believers. I'll tell you why they're believers. Because they're dressed in white clothing and they have been redeemed and they are wrapped up in the righteousness of Christ. And angels or anything else is not represented as redeemed. And, and, and a believer is. So I believe these 24 elders represent believers in some way. And the golden crowns that they have, they're rewards given to earthly, given to uh, those for their earthly deeds at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, do you have this one, Second Corinthians 5.10? <laughs> Hope you do. Get yeah, back to the other one. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5.10. Oh, I've got 1 Corinthians 5.10. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It is 1 Corinthians 5.10. Look, when you start reading it, I'll know. I've got 2nd over here and I've got 1st <laughs> over here. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Okay, we all believers will go before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll either receive wards or we won't receive, just depending on, you know, what we did, what we did with their Christianity and their family. Okay? All right. Uh, John, go back to your other sheet and read verse 5. Revelation, verse 5. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. All right. Coming from the throne, John sees these flashes of lightning, rumblings, and, and peals of thunder. This is signaling that a great storm is coming. God's patience has reached its limits. And John sees the seven spirits of God. The Spirit of God is all fired up and ready for the storm as imminent. All right, John, read verse 6. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Okay, this crystal sea could represent the church. Are there's there's many times in especially in the Old Testament when the ocean and the sea was used in to represent a mass of humanity. We don't know for sure 
but some even believe that crystal sea uh, represents the water of the word. And Ephesians 5, 26. John, can you read that? Okay. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Okay. So some believe it, it's standing for the word. One thing for sure, and some people just believe thinks it represents something to do with baptism. So I'll I'll leave y'all to that. I, I kind of think it represents masses of humanity. Uh, whatever it stands for, we can see that even if this is a sea of glass, that it's very calm and and uh it indicates that everything around the throne here is very calm, even though there's something fixing to take place. And it just shows that the ones around the throne have complete faith in the one on the throne, that he has total control over the storm that's about to start. All right, there are four unusual creatures in, at the throne and they have eyes all around. These creatures are angelic beings who are able to see all. Okay, John, read uh, Revelation 4, 7 and 8. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. All right. John, again, is using picture words to help us try to visualize, because he's never seen this before, and we've not ever seen it at all. So he's using picture words to help us see this. these creatures. One has a face like a lion. This could possibly represent and symbolize the character of Christ. In Matthew's gospel, he taught that Jesus was the lion of Judah and the king of kings. Now, the second creature had a face that looked like a calf or an ox. Now, that's a service animal. And if you read Mark's gospel, it describes Jesus as a servant to mankind. The third creature had a face like a man. And Luke, in the gospel of Luke, he is seen as his humanity. When he, when he writes his gospel, he writes of the humanity of Christ, and he calls him the Son of Man. Now, the fourth creature has a face like an eagle, and John's gospel describes Jesus as the creator and ruler of all things, and eagles soar in the heavens and often represent deity. All four creatures have six wings and eyes all around and they never stop worshiping. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Okay, John, read uh, verses 9 through 11. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. All of these creatures worship God. The 24 elders fall on their face before the one on the throne and cast their crowns at his feet. He is worthy to receive glory, honor, and power, for he is the creator of all things. 
That brings us to chapter 5. And to set this chapter up, I want you to uh, understand a little thing like they did in the Old Testament when God told them, when he brought them into the promised land, how they were to treat their their property that was assigned to them. He instructed them to set up certain rules for selling their property and the land that he had given them. When a family was faced with a a financial problem and had to uh, sell their land, they had to draw up two contracts. One was an unsealed contract and became public record. The second was a sealed scroll that had seven seals and was placed in the temple by the priest. The seller could always buy back his property as long as he met the criteria of the contract. But if the seller died before he was able to buy back the land, then the next of kin could step in and buy it back. The next of kin was called a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer. These rules gave everyone a chance to retrieve their land and keep it in the family. This was what took place in the story of Ruth. Y'all remember that. And then there was a story in Jeremiah where that took place. Now the kinsman redeemer had to show proof to the priest that he indeed was the next of kin and that he could meet all the requirements of the contract. Then the priest would bring out the sealed scroll and check the requirements written on the scroll. Then if the Redeemer met each one, he would receive the deed back for the land. Now when God created the earth, he gave ownership to Adam and Eve. However, when they sinned, they lost that ownership to Satan. However, We will see in chapter 5, someone was found worthy to buy it back. John read verses 1 and 2 in chapter 5. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seal? All right, John sees God holding a book or a scroll that has seven seals. There is writing on both sides of the scroll. And it seems to be really important to all of those in heaven. John sees a powerful angel proclaiming who is worthy to open the the seals. Number one, this this, uh, scroll is a little bit unusual because it's written on both sides. This possibly symbolizes that the scroll is complete. Number two, it's sealed with seven seals. And that means not just anybody can break those seals. It has to be someone who meets the criteria or the qualifications. John read verses three through five. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome So it's to open the book, and it's seven sealed. So right at first, there seems to be no one that's that's qualified to open the seven seals. So John is just terribly upset, and he just begins to weep. And one of the elders speak up and says, John, there is one. He's the Lion of Judah. He's the Root of David. And he's the Overcoming. He's qualified to break the seals. John read verse 6. And I saw between the throne 
with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out unto all the earth. All right, John sees a lamb that appears to have been slain. But take a look. This lamb is standing. He's not laying on an altar dead, and he's not laying, laying in a casket. He has seven horns and seven eyes. Seven, of course, is the number of completeness. Horns are symbolic of power, and the seven eyes are the seven spirits. Again, it keeps repeating that seven shows completeness. All right, John, read. Uh, wait, a minute, wait, 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 wait. Jesus has been given all power over all things. Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. It's on your other sheet. Okay. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Okay. Now read uh, verses 7 and 8 in Revelation. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. All right, the lamb takes the scroll from the one sitting on the throne because he's found worthy. The creatures and the elders just fall on their face and worship. These guys fall down every time they get the opportunity to show their devotion to the Lord. Each one has a harp, in a golden bowl full of the prayers of the saints. Isn't it comforting to know that when we pray, these prayers don't get lost somewhere between earth and the third heaven where God is. He's got them all in a bowl right there. That's kind of comforting to know, isn't it? Big bowl. Big bowl. <laughs> John, would you read verses 9 and 10? And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seal. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and, tribe and, tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. All right. They sing a new song. Now, back in chapter 4, if y'all will remember, they sing about God the Creator. Here in chapter 5, they're singing about God the Redeemer. This coming kingdom is made up of all peoples, and they will reign with Christ on earth. All right, John, read 11 through 14. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures of the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard say. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. All right. All of a sudden, all of heaven breaks out into worship. It's as though they've held it in as long as they can, and they've just got to let it loose. And there's myriads and myriads of angels, which means uncountable. And the four creatures and the, the 24 elders and every living thing in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and in the sea, he is worthy to receive power, wealth, strength, wisdom, honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. And of course, what did the 24 elders do? 
they fell on the face of the Lord. <laughs> We're not totally sure these, el these elders represent the church, but isn't it a nice thought to think that that is us up there at every opportunity falling on their face before the Lord? Any questions? We got through just in time. All right. No questions? When we leave next week. All right. Next week we'll have six and seven. We're doing two every time, or is it? We'll be doing two every time. There'll be one time we'll do three, so that we can get them all in before Thanksgiving. Here. <laughs> this is a crash course on revelation. Okay, y'all, bow with me. Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you, Lord, that you enlighten us and give us knowledge about your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are worthy forever and ever to be praised. Thank you for these people that have come to learn your word. I ask you to be with them all week and bring them back next week. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. Thank <laughs> you.